The Lord be with you. We'll be listening this morning to Luke, to Jesus' words in Luke chapter 11. But before we get there, as I mentioned earlier, we, we are sort of on what I'm, I'm calling the precipice of possibility. Don't you like that? Doesn't that sound like the title of a book Oprah would read? The precipice of possibility. We're standing there looking out. We know now we are within, within striking distance of being out of debt. And for many of us, that's, a, that's a, a mountain over which we've climbed and are pretty happy about. But when we look over that mountain, we realize there is that precipice of possibility. There is all sorts of things out in front of us. All manner of possibilities that God has placed there. And so in the coming weeks, we, we look out. We ask, what if? Now that question can be scary to some people, right? What if things go wrong? What if it doesn't work out? What if I did the wrong thing? What if I make the wrong decision? What if, what if? But put all that junk aside. I want to ask the question, what if things go well? What if... We listen and God speaks. What if when God speaks, we listen and obey? What if? And so today I want to start asking that question and ask the questions beneath, undergirding that question. And this morning I want to ask, what if, before we did anything else, before we made our, our opinions known, before we set down the plans on paper. What if we prayed first? And so in doing that, I want to call our attention to Jesus' words in Luke chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, I pray that we hear what you would have us to hear. That we hear your words, Lord, and not mine. Words that call us forward. Call us out, perhaps, into the unknown, but call us, Lord, knowing that you go with us. So, Lord, speak to us. Speak to us the reality of what would happen, Lord, if we prayed first. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So, yeah, what if we prayed first? Now, I don't know about you, but that's not how I do things all the time. I know shock, right? Um, but no, like in my, in my house, in our house, uh, if, I do, if we pay off something, right, or if we have made a step 
in a good, in a direction I don't I don't always pray for. Sometimes I already know what I'm going to do, right? I've already got it figured out. I already think I know what I'm going to do. I don't have to I don't have to consult anything. I just know this is the next step. And sometimes in the life of the church, we, we tend to do the same thing, right? We've lived with something long enough that we just kind of figure, well, this is the next step. Now, I won't say anyone's names, but I know several of you have already had conversations with me and with each other when you came in this morning and you look down the aisle and go, boy, I sure hope I don't trip on the carpet. Little rolls right in the carpet coming up. Or, or you've been in the parking lot, got out of the car, and stepped in a hole after it rained. Boy, I sure wish we'd do something about the parking lot, right? Or maybe, maybe if you're new, if you're relatively new to the church and you've come to Sunday school and just wandered the hall, well, where am I supposed to go? Because there's no signs telling you where to go. Nothing laid out on the ground, right, saying a bathroom this way, Sunday school this way. We, we try not to mark the exits because we don't want you to find the exits. Um, but really, some of us, we already have it planned out, right? There's some of you. Some of you in this room who've been going to this church for years, maybe even your whole life, and you've never seen the second floor because you can't get up the stairs, right? And so you say, you know, it'd be nice if we had an elevator to get up there. We all have the second sort of step. We all have the thing in mind, right? And so sometimes we think we don't need to pray. We just, we just have it figured out, right? God's, gonna, God's been telling me this for years. We say, that's what I say. God's been telling me this for years. But what if, what if, right now, starting right now, before we can even launch out of the gate, right? Right now, we started to pray and used Christ's teachings on prayer as a bit of an outline for how to pray. It sounds silly to tell a room full of church folks that we need to learn how to pray, right? But Jesus here, his disciples, Jesus, I think this is important. Jesus has been off by himself praying. Did you notice that? Jesus is not above praying first. Of the old people who had a, ought, ought to have it all figured out, know where it's going. It's Jesus, right? But Jesus, before he does it, prays. How much more should we, right? Pray. So he comes, he's finished, his disciples say, oh, Lord, could you teach us how to pray the way that John's disciples taught him, taught them? And so Jesus says to them, this is Luke's version of, of Matthew's more familiar version of the Lord's Prayer, right? And he says, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Isn't that interesting? Right at the beginning, it's not, okay, God, this is what I want. Or God, show me that Father, holy is your name, hallowed is your name. That's not like the salutation to a letter. Uh, Dear God, comma, this is what I'm praying about. No, no. It's a recognition immediately that before anything else, before all other things, is God. That in the center of all that we do ought to be God. That when we come into this place on Sunday mornings, at the center of all that we do and all that we are, is God. When we walk out of this place, the center of all that we do and all that we are is God. So really, more than me, more than you, more than any single committee or any single body in this church, there is one force guiding everything. It's God. So as we begin to pray about the next step, what is the next thing? The next chapter in the, in the book of First Baptist Church of Williams, it all ought to start and is going to have to start with God. God, what do you want us to do? We start with God. But notice the next thing. The next thing Jesus says is not, all right, now once you've established that it's God, then you start asking for stuff, right? It's not what happens. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Luke leaves it there, but we know the rest, right, in the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The second thing in that prayer is to pray for the kingdom of God to break in. Notice that language, right? Your kingdom come, not, uh, Lord, when we die, we want to go to your kingdom. That's hard, right? Some of you bristle a little bit. No, no, that's backwards. No, Jesus said, your kingdom come. 
That when we pray, we're praying that God's kingdom falls down here on us. That's the thing, right? So God is the center of all that we do. But the purpose, why do we do what we do? Your kingdom come. Most of you know right now, we're working on putting our budget together uh, for the next year, right? For 2018. And every year we do this, it sometimes can be a little tedious. Some of you who are on uh, committees and stuff, when you get that sheet, you just go, ah, oh, just give me what we got last year. I don't want to fool with this. And some of us really sit down and think about it and you feel it out and you've got it itemized right down to who you're going to buy it from on what day, that sort of thing. Uh, some of you, some of us. But, but when we do all this, sometimes it can feel real tedious and like it's the one thing I hear it all the time. This feels so unlike church. Talking about budgets and stuff just doesn't feel like church. Well, I want to I say something to you now as your pastor. And don't, don't, please don't try to hear me say it like the voice of somebody like Joel Osteen. Um, when we talk about the budget, that's not, that's not a, a, a document of practicality. The budget of a church is a confessional document. It says, this is what we believe to be important. This is what we believe about our role in your kingdom come. I'll give you some examples. It's not always just the budget stuff. So far this year, we spent almost $15,000 just in local missions. Local. That's stuff like building wheelchair ramps, uh, building a, a, a handicap accessible room onto someone's home. And that's just dollars. Those of you who've been acting in that, you know how many hours you've done, how much your time is worth. If we started charging the folks, or if the folks who were helping us started charging us, we couldn't afford it. So it's not just dollars. It's volunteer hours that people have spent putting into those things, just in local missions, going to Texas and helping the folks there has reached almost $10,000 in giving. $1,500 every month to feed people. That's a small price to pay, by the way. $1,500. What's this about? What's the budget? What's, what's the check you're writing about? Your kingdom come. Now somebody will say, yeah, but you know, some of that stuff goes to paying bills. Well, yeah. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven ain't free. <laughs> but think about this for a minute. I'm going to be honest with you right now. We can have church in the dark. We can have church in the dark. We can open these windows. I can stop wearing a, a jacket and a, I, may, I may keep some clothes on. But we can, uh, we can have church in the dark. It, it don't matter. It's not about that. Do you know why we pay the power bill every month? Five days a week, 50 or more kids meet in this building for daycare and after school programs. And they come here because their families believe it's a safe and comfortable place for them to be. Their trust, they trust us here in our building. Not only that, but countless basketball teams practice in our gym. We can call it a Christian ministry center. It's a gym. They practice in the gym. They use our softball field. They come in this room and have events like baccalaureate in here. Yeah, we, the, the kingdom of heaven's got bills attached to it, folks. That's what we do. And it's not just, well, we got to pay it. It's your kingdom come. It's the inbreaking of God's kingdom. It's what we do. And it's not just about our money. It's not just, it's about our time and the things that we give. Because I hear it, you know, well, I can't give a whole lot, but, but I got I to gotta get home and watch my court shows or something like that, right? It's about giving yourself all of who you are. So when we pray about what's next, right? God's at the center. What's the point? What's the purpose of what we do? Your kingdom come. I love this next line because you're wondering, how in the world does this have anything to do with church? Give us each day our daily bread. Now, now that can also be translated and give us today enough bread for tomorrow. But the idea is, Lord, give us enough. Just enough. Now, sometimes, sometimes enough is more than we can imagine, right? Sometimes enough is more than what we think. So when we pray, give us each day our daily bread, Lord, give us enough. As we think about the future, Lord, show us what's enough, right? Sometimes we have it in our mind that, that enough may be lower than we decide what's enough, right? That's enough. 
That's enough. But I think, I think sometimes God calls us to see it enough as more than what we think enough is. Do you follow me? That sometimes it's easy to give into the thinking that, well, well, that's enough. But when we're called to pray, it's like, Lord, show us what's enough. Show us, stretch us, call us to more. Call us to more than what's enough in our eyes. What is enough to you? That's actually a bold prayer. Give us enough. Show us enough. Call us to enough. Because sometimes our idea of enough, of our daily bread, leaves our stomach growling at about noon. And God's calling us to a whole lot more. So when we pray God's at the center, the whole reason we do what we do is the inbreaking of God's kingdom. And God calls us, Lord, help us to know what is enough. Call us to enough. And forgive our sins as we forgive everyone indebted to us. Now, now one translation of that is forgive our debts as we forgive those indebted to us. And as we talk about paying off a debt, that's a nice prayer to pray, right? Lord, forgive us our debts. We prayed for it. We don't have to pay it anymore. But the idea there is not not about indebtedness financially. This is a prayer about relationships. Can I I just be honest with you? If I had a collar, I'd take it off right now. It is hard sometimes for me to like church. Can can any, any of you agree? It's hard for me sometimes to just like church. I don't mean what we're doing right now. I just mean like the organism and institution of church. Sometimes I feel like Jesus is like knocking on the door and church is just like, no, we ain't got time for Jesus. We try and do church, right? But the one thing that always sort of grounds me, keeps me where I'm at, calls me back to doing church is the fact that in this room and in rooms just like it right now, while we're doing the same thing, are people who don't speak our language, people who don't look like us, people who are in different parts of the world, even right now, you're probably sitting on the pew with somebody who doesn't agree with you on, I'm sorry to say it, everything. There are people in this room who voted differently from you, people in this room who think differently from you, people in this room who have differing opinions about whether or not pineapple should be on pizza than you. For the record, pineapple should be on pizza, but that's another. But see, if you disagree with me, we are still in the same room. I love that. There is something powerful about that. That God doesn't doesn't try to use just a systematized same people. That in the church, God is calling all of us as different as we are with our different means and our different abilities and our different gifts to do the same thing. And you know that there are people who are different than you. And you know there are people who aren't like you. And you know there are people who think different. And people you would have arguments and fights with, and yet still, you're in this room with them right now. There is something powerful about that. And so as we pray, keep in mind, yes, God's at our center. We're doing this in the inbreaking of God's kingdom. We're doing this asking for God to show us what's enough. But you're also asking it with people who aren't going to think the same way you do that are going to ask for totally different things than you do. And that part of this life together, part of this this step we take together as a church means sometimes I'm going to have to give a little more than I take. Sometimes it means reluctantly I'm going to have to take a little bit more than I give. Because that's life together. That's part of what being church is about. That we do this together. And we forgive those who are indebted to us as we trust that they forgive us. Whether they do or not is irrelevant. We forgive them. That's what he says. And do not bring us to the time of trial. Now, some people like to think that's some real spiritual mumbo jumbo, right? Don't bring us into temptation. Don't let me walk by Mad Hatter's downtown and see that they got some kind of peanut butter cupcake on special. Don't let me do it, Lord. Don't let me drive by cookout and see that the line is actually short now. Don't let me do it. Lead me from temptation, right? That's what we think. I think it's more serious. That might be part of it. But I think it's more serious. As we think, as we pray together about what's the next step, what is God leading us to next, there is a temptation, right? To want to just do it all. 
a temptation to say, boy, as soon as the check clears, let's go do something else. Let's go do this big, giant thing I have in mind. I once worked for a church. And for right or wrong, that was their thinking. Millions of dollars later, had a nice facility, nice new carpet everywhere, new paint on the walls, new everything everywhere. It was nice. That was about 2006 or 7. Something happened in 2008, right? Some of y'all in construction know what I'm talking about. One year later, all the things they had done could have been done for half as much. And they didn't know what to do. They gave in to that temptation to say, we can just do whatever we want. Build it bigger, build it better, just keep on, keep on, it's good. But I also knew a church that gave in to the temptation the other way. They would regularly brag to themselves, we're debt free. We got money in the bank, a million dollars just sitting in the bank. Do you want to do it? No, no, better not. We don't want to take a, we don't want to take a risk, don't want to take a chance, don't want to follow God on this. We, we're comfortable here, we're good here, let's stay right here while we dwindle. Well, nothing gets done. All the kingdom of God breaks through in other places, but not right here. The temptation is sometimes to follow the least common denominator. To do whatever it is that's comfortable or whatever it is that we just so desperately want ourselves. It's an odd line to walk. I saw that line in a sanctuary once. Beautiful place, dark wood paneling, nice pews, 12 stained glass windows. Two of them had pictures of Jesus. Do you know what was in the other 10 windows? Pictures of Brother Bob, of Sister Sue, of the founders of the congregation, of the governor of the state. Those sorts of things. And the whole time I thought, oh, there's the line. There's the line of temptation. To build grand cathedrals in our honor or to build them in God's. It's a, it's a tricky line. But it's the line of temptation. And so Jesus says as you pray, say, Lord, lead us not to the time of trial. So as we pray together, we pray knowing that God is at the center of what we do. God is in in all of this, permeating all of this, outside of all of this. I I love the way the astrophysicists say it, though they don't say it about God. God is every possibility and every impossibility. God is everything. We ought to recognize that. Recognize that our purpose and our place as a church is this inbreaking of God's kingdom. To bring God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. To make the world look a little bit more like heaven. As much as we can. To do it with just enough. To pray that God shows us what is enough. Even if it's more than what we think. To do it together. In spite of our differences. For we are called church of differences. Different people. And to not give in to the temptations of what's easy or what's grandiose, but to follow God. And I love the parable after Jesus teaches them that. You notice he doesn't stop. You probably wonder, I wish the preacher would stop. But he doesn't. The next thing is a parable of persistence. And here's what I want to leave you with. This doesn't stop right here. A call to prayer is not just something we do. Okay, we're at church. I'll pray now. When you go out from this place, begin to pray even now. Lord, what do you want us to do? What's the next thing? I've got my ideas. You've got yours. But what are God's? Let's pray together. Because what would happen? What would happen if we prayed first? If we prayed persistently? if we continued to seek God's direction for our church, for the next chapter, for the next step? What if, before we did anything else, we prayed first? That being said, let us pray.
holy God. Lord, we, your church, the First Baptist Church of Williams, Lord, we begin now to earnestly and intentionally pray for your direction. Lord, we know that we are coming to a a time in our history, in the life of our church. We have an opportunity for great things. But Lord, we pray that the great things that lay before us come from you and for the work of your kingdom. That they are not works that are driven from our sense of self, our desire to be recognized. So God, go before us as we pray. Go within us as we pray. Surround us as we pray, God. Show us your will for what you would have us to do. And let us be persistent in our prayer. For God, if we, who as your son said, are evil, know how to give good gifts to our children, How much more, Lord, will you give us the Holy Spirit when we pray and ask? So, Lord, give us your spirit, a spirit of direction as we go forth from this place. And now as we listen, as we listen for you to speak, in Christ's name we pray. Amen.